In this demonstration, we'll look at a general joint between two line bodies, between two beams. We'll then look at how that joint has been manipulated to give it specific degrees of freedom and some elasticity. I will start by reviewing the geometry in Design Modeler. Two sketches were placed on the XY plane. Sketch 1 is for the first body. Sketch 2 is for the second body. These are used to create line bodies. Here is the first line body, created from sketch 1. And on the right is the second line body, created from sketch 2. We have to give a cross section. I've chosen a circular cross section. You can see the yellow circle in this image. And that was set to a radius of 3 millimeters, meaning a diameter of 6 millimeters. Once things have been generated, we have our first line body on the left, our second line body on the right. You can see them one and two. And it's important to note that they have independent vertices right here. There are two vertices coincident right here at the origin of the coordinate system. I can turn on a view of the cross-section solids. Here you see that circular cross-section on top of the line bodies. So that's what the resulting geometry is going to look like. I'll exit Design Modeler now. And let's go look at the FEA model in Workbench Mechanical. Let's go full screen with Workbench Mechanical. Let's have an isometric view. It isn't very visible, but the two line bodies are in here. If I open up geometry, there's the first one on the left and the second one on the right. I've already meshed them, and when I show you the mesh, you see the cross section that was imported. That's actually a circular cross section. It's simply been faceted for display purposes, but it is the circular cross-section that we put in before. I've meshed it with three elements per physical beam. You should have more than one beam element in a physical beam in order to better capture the curvature that they take on. You may recall that a beam deformed by gravity could have a fourth-order curve with that distributed load. The beam finite elements don't have fourth-order curves, so to approximate the physical beam deformation, you should have several finite element beams down the length of a real physical beam. We're just using one coordinate system. However, there's a reference coordinate system for the joint between these two beams. Let's go see what we've done. First of all, we have two remote points. One is a vertex on the body on the left, that's the reference, and the mobile point for the joint is on the body on the right. Let's look under connections. A joint has been defined. It's a general joint, and it's placed on the vertices on the left and right bodies. You can see here that we have remote points on the reference and mobile sides. Those remote points are the general one here, general line-to-body reference, that's this one, and the other. You can see here the mobile side is that reference point right here, which is on the right-hand body. The general joint can have up to all six degrees of freedom available. If I look at the details for a general joint, you'll see that I get some control. I can free or fix translations in X, in Y, and in Z, or Z in American English. So for this joint, the ends of the two beams are being held together in the Y and Z directions, but the joint is free to slide in the X direction, and that is in the reference coordinate system for this joint. 
I've added some spring-like elasticities at that joint. So this is a bushing connecting the same two vertices together, the remote point on the reference side and the remote point on the mobile side. On the main diagonal I've put in a stiffness for that movement in the X direction. Remember that Y and Z were fixed. And I've put in a slight rotational stiffness again on the main diagonal. So there's a bit of stiffness if you try to rotate about Y or about Z coming in with these numbers here. You're seeing those numbers per degree. You can control that up under units. Do you want to work in degrees or radians? If I look at my general joint, you can see from the colors here in the legend that movements in the X direction of that reference coordinate system have been freed up, and also rotations about X, Y, and Z. Now, I don't really want it to be free to rotate about X. I want the behavior of a universal joint, but a universal joint will not permit movement in the X direction. So, I've resorted to a little device. I've put a constraint equation into my model under the static structural branch, under the structural environment. In that constraint equation, I refer to the two remote points, the one on the reference side and the one on the mobile side. I use the degree of freedom there, which is rotations around x, and I have them in effect coupled by putting in coefficients for the constraint equation so that those rotations can't be free. There will be no rotation around the x-axis because I have a minus sign and a plus sign for the two coefficients. I have a fixed point back here and because I've fixed this end I've called this body on the reference side whereas this is the mobile side, so that's fully fixed, all six degrees of freedom. And for the purpose of illustration, I'm putting a displacement in on this end. You'll notice I've set up three load steps. In the first one, I move this point in the Z direction over here. In the second load step, I move it back. And in the third load step, I stretch this thing in the X direction, down the axis, opening up this joint. If I turn on my view of vertices, you can see this is the one that I fixed. Here, that's where the two links join together with a joint, and here's the vertex that I'm deforming. If I click, this is in release 17.0 of ANSYS, if I click this button, it gives me a symbol that shows me that this is where the vertices are, that there are more than one on the same point in space. If I simply click geometry, you'll see that yellow indicating that that's where the vertices are close together. They are, in fact, coincident. Here are my analysis settings. You'll notice I've indicated three load steps, and because I'm producing large rotations, I've turned a large deflection analysis. In order to track this large displacement, I've indicated 20 substeps per load step. Let's go to a worksheet view of my analysis settings, and here you'll see that all three load steps were asked to go through 20 substeps. That we have convergence all left to program controlled. A variety of settings then are all the same for all three load steps. If we go back here, again notice that large deflection has been turned on. We go down, we solve, here's the deformation plot, and this is at the end of the third load step. You'll see it here and also that we're at time three. This is where we have opened up that gap by pulling on this end in the X direction. We can check out force reactions, and because there's a spring stiffness in here, we are seeing that a reaction opens up. Let's animate what happens. We're going through three load steps. First, we're moving this point 
in Z, then we move it back, and then we stretch it out in X. Let's go with an animation that puts up a frame for every point. Let's make it a 4 second animation and let it run. There it is moving over, moving back, and then stretching. Over and back and stretching. Let's take an overhead view of the same thing. Over and back and then stretching. Same thing, over and back and stretching. And it moves in an arc because it is a large displacement analysis. Let's go to a front view and to make it slightly easier to see what we're doing, we'll rotate down just slightly over and back and then stretching over back and stretching so in this model we have what is in effect a universal joint made out of a general joint because that constraint equation was put in so that there's no free rotation around the x-axis of the joint we've put in a displacement over three load steps to indicate what happens, and we trace out the kinds of movements that we want. Let's look at analysis settings one more time. Notice that weak springs were turned off, they aren't necessary. It's a very small model with beam elements, so I chose a direct solver, and I did turn on large deflection, and I did solve over many substeps, and under output controls, I saved the results at all time points so that we could run those animations from the saved points during the analysis. Thank you for joining me.